This is Jonathan Gee, interview number two, conducted by Peter Moon. The date is October 17th, 2018. Uh, good morning, Jonathan. How are you? Uh, good morning, Peter. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. So this is a podcast that we're, is uh, very organic in nature because we just did the uh, previous podcast last week. And I want to know if you've had any, of course, the podcast is on the subject of Dr. John D. and his uh, his magic, his uh, work, his scholarly work as well. Have you had any uh, impressions or feelings since the last interview, Jonathan? Uh, actually, not on the topic, because uh, there was a hurricane that day, and it took the power out on my house for a couple of days after that, so I was... Uh, kind of recouping from that. Well, that, that says a lot in and of itself uh, that we, you know, that the time we, we had this conversation was just right as the hurricane was happening, which, of course, it was not happening up here on Long Island, but uh, you survived it okay? Absolutely. Uh, there was no damage to the structures of my house or any of my friends' houses, so we made it through good. Well, that's fortuitous, and, and I'm glad to hear that. Now, um, so basically, I, you know, instigated this podcast because it, it uh, the work of John D is interest of interest to me because it tends to show up in conjunction with my time travel research, vis-a-vis -vis Dr. David Anderson. So, I, uh, you know, basically what had happened, I had, um, I don't know if I mentioned this on the other podcast, but a, a lady who had been at a, a symposium in Long Island conducted by my in-laws uh, was from Prague and she had uh, expressed an enthusiasm for maybe generating an event we were hoping to have in Prague. This, this was an idea that I had last year at the previous symposium, symposium and David Anderson had warmed up to it. Uh, he was very interested in visiting the Czech Republic. He had some friends to see there. So my idea was to do an event on the work of Dr. John D in Prague. So this lady, being from Prague, sort of helped feed the idea. But in seemingly independent of that, something else occurred in the wake of our podcast. And I don't remember exactly how it came across, but I came across this author. Uh, it was actually a video. And I uh, was very um, surprised to see that somebody had done so much work on John D. Um, the name, the man's name was Jason, uh, I think Louvre. Did, and I sent that link to you. Did you get a chance to look at it? Uh, I looked it through the first few minutes of it. Yeah. What was your impression of him and his work? Uh, he certainly had a lot of complimentary reviews from, uh, people in the, in the magical field. John, Jason, excuse me, Jason Louv is his name, L-O-U-V, and he's a mm -hmm. prolific author and uh, on the younger side of life, I would say. Go ahead. Go ahead. What was your impression? Uh, I'm, first impression is he's articulate. Uh, he's, you know, obviously well-read uh, and well-versed in the modern uh, released uh, material. Yes, and he, he received a, a lot of complimentary reviews. His, um, he has a lot of excessive eye blinking, excessive eye blinking. Uh, and of course, when you, you, somebody who's deeply threaded with this work, I look at them from a, certainly not from the most, not just the irreducible minimum glances. What, what is this person really all about? What, what's really going on? Because in the field of magic, as you probably well know, the people who are involved with it are often, more often than not, askew, or there's something about them or their energy field that is askew. And I suppose that's just the nature of, of the beast, at least when one is approaching it from this dimension. Um, I, I might have mentioned this with Vincent Bridges, who did a very scholarly many scholarly lectures on Jonathan D and particularly Edward Kelly D's partner where his energy 
is very askew, although he's, he's, his scholarship is brilliant. Um, as I, I mentioned, I, I might have mentioned this privately, privately, but he's actually, you know, taking on the ambiance of Igor physiologically as he begins to talk. It's almost like he's becoming the golem as he gets deeper into the studies. And this is, of course, one of the, the greatest dangers of studying the occult is you become sort of the, the food for the feast. <laughs> and uh, this can happen with people. But what, as in the wake of listening to this uh, podcast with uh, Mr. Louvre, it was, it, somehow it came to me uh, to generate some Enochian language on, on my Facebook posting. And I, somehow it occurred to me that, gee, there's so many, uh, a, so, so much AI out there and, and other just scholarship that I found out that you can translate almost anything into the Enochian language now. You can even uh, get proper pronunciations. So what, what this means is the Enochian language has become it, been put into a pedestrian stream of consciousness. In other words, this knowledge was guarded for hundreds of years, and it was also used to manipulate uh, governments, politics, occult secrets. It's, so we, we're now in a new, um, a new age here where this language and has been put into the hands of the common man, if the common man is so astute to seek it out. And one of my uh, long-term subscribers had, had made a comment on the Facebook that he said that uh, he put the Enochian language into what I posted into Google Translate and it claimed it was Hindi. And I said, well, that's because Google has not yet uh, been programmed to recognize Enochian. And I said, it will probably figure it out on its own, the AI that's involved, because Google Translate gets better all the time. So it's sort of self-correcting. So here we are living in an age, and this is what I want your comment on, where Enochian is moving into the realm of the commoner. Comment. Well, I can only comment with a question in turn. Why do you think that is happening? What's I mean, that? not based on evidence, but based on motivation. Uh, obviously, what you're describing is a phenomenon that's occurring around us uh, at the present, but to what end? Well, that's a very good question, and I, I think I can answer that uh, through, through the process of analogy. If somebody discovers gold everybody wants to go at it, like the California gold rush. Everybody was rushing to uh, California, and in particular, the Chinese. So, you know, it's, if, if somebody, there's a, a rush to build something, invent something, there's always a rush to, be, to get the upper hand. And when it comes, so when it comes to the John Dee's work, this stuff has been studying, been studied seriously, uh, and intentfully for many years, for, you know, decades and, and, and at least a century and probably more. But so people take this very seriously and they tend to stay either out of the limelight or it's circulated amongst very close groups. But this and, and all of the hard work these people done have done has obviously enabled somebody um, like this character, Jason, to do a, a full, comprehensive, scholarly rendition of what John Dee had to bring to the table. Um, you can't, you know, let the personalities and whatnot, and, and I don't say this in refer reference to Jason because I don't know him, but many of the personalities around this, this phenomena, as I said earlier, are askew. And if they're not askew, they would certainly seem very askew to the average, say, commoner who would go and approach them 
or have interactions with them. And because you're, you're moving into a rarefied field when you go to study this stuff. Now, um, back to, to answer your question, why is this being done? Is because if we look at this either astrologically or, or Kabbalistically, we have the archetype known as Uranus, which is astrology. In Kabbalah, it would be Metatron. People like to call it Metatron. Uh, and this is a archetype of upheaval, innovation, and technology. Uranus was, in, in Greek mythology, was the originator of, he, was, he represented heaven, and he mated with Gaia, the earth. And so basically, he was a very powerful archetype, constantly creating. He created so much and so compulsively that an archetype called Saturn, who had the, the sky, you know, the Grim Reaper, and he literally cut the nuts off of Uranus. He castrated him, and he threw the genitals of Uranus into the sea, where it gave birth to Venus. So Uranus was creating now in a new form. It's, it's went to create Venus and, and create a more, what we know as a conventional form of uh, creation in the context of love. Now, Uranus, even though he was castrated and killed and unseated by his son Saturn, or Kronos, which is time, Kronos in Greek, the Romans said Saturn, Saturn was putting a lid on Uranus because if you have too much creation all the time, it, it's like having Ro Robin Williams next to you every minute of your life, a, a, the comedian Robin Williams, nonstop chatter, entertaining, funny at times, irritating, you drive you nuts, finally. So this is why this had to, to take place. Now, but even though Uranus was killed, he was sort of resurrected and put in the heavens because he had so much to offer. So when you have this element, why is this happening now? You have technology, which not only enables uh, all this stuff to be studied at a much more rapid clip, it applies artificial intelligence uh, and whatnot to make, make this language translatable, available, and this is why. It's the technology of the archetype of Uranus is, is what's given us this. So um, we are in new times. And I suppose if you looked at the exact placement of Uranus right now, it, it might be, uh, I think it's in Taurus. I don't follow astrology that closely. So it would be having uh, innovations in Earth-based elements. So anyway, does that answer your question? Uh, essentially, I guess. Yeah, so, so this is the point. Now, the... See, the language is one thing, but these words are associated with power. So one Enochian uh, scholar was saying to me in the wake of this podcast that this was, in his opinion, this was the language that was spoken long, long ago, sometimes identified with Vril, where the power of the in intonation the vibration of the intonation in the words has a power designed to it. So if you were to do a spell or a grimoire or a grammar in English, it would have much less power than if you did it in the Anakian language. Therefore, we're dealing with this power that is used over governments, people, institutions and whatnot is now becoming open source. This is, I guess, the word open source to where people can go in and believe you me, people will go in and start playing with this stuff if they're not already. I'm sure they are. But as you know, this is just like the, the pyramid going, the average person walking on the street doesn't even know what a Nokian is. He's probably not too interested, but there are certainly a great base of 
either fans, curiosity seekers, and many curiosity seekers in the past uh, go into the into the dark side. They dive right in there. And this is also an issue because if you have the common person using it, before it gets to them, it's going to be open for misuse or selfish use by factions that are not so upbeat. Over to you. <laughs> well, um, let's say that uh, the technology is proving a floodgate to opening Pandora's box. Uh, I don't necessarily agree that the Enochian magic is a system that has power over government, uh, the governments of, of people. Uh, I think it's been used as an encryption system to spy with, so it has been employed by the government at one point, uh, but I don't think successfully by them. Uh, also, I think the technology that's growing around us now is kind of an outgrowth itself of the Enochian system uh, being a purely elemental cycle uh, that tends to generate uh, massive influxes of energy and productivity at certain peak periods in history. Well, that's certainly an interesting concept, and if you could perhaps elaborate on the idea that um, the, the Anakian language uh, is generating, you know, what you said, uh, generating, it's, it, in other words, it itself is generating this revolution in technology, which in turn make la makes the language more accessible, uh, decipherable, understandable, usable, etc., well, if we think about it in terms of language, then the best analogy for Enochian would be as a computer programming code language. Uh, it would be basically the green code that you see in the Matrix movies, uh, underlying the probabilities of everything, I guess. But uh, I've generally tended to look at it more as the elements uh, in lieu of uh, Rigardi's uh, Golden Dawn material, which was generated initially by Mathers, but was based on uh, based on Dee's and Oking's system of the four watchtowers. Uh, that system seems to be uh, essentially a circuit board or the hardware on which the uh, Nokian alphabet and the Enochian language are the programming code language of the software. I do recall that you did a very uh, good uh, rendition of, of the Watchtowers and how they related to the Enochian system, and those are on your, uh, your, your videos, if you could just give your website again for people who are interested. Well, actually, uh, the best place to find that would be on my YouTube channel, uh, that's also called Ben Padia, B E N P A D I A H. If you just Google YouTube and Ben Padia and Enochian, a playlist should come up. Good, because this whole idea, what, what you seem to be saying, and, and you can correct me if I'm not accurate, is that it's the elements themselves and the permutation of the elements and all of those different potentials that in turn uh, either influences or generates the Anakian language itself? Uh, in a sense, I think the uh, Anakian letters in the Watchtowers are kind of like uh, oil on top of water in terms of the uh, elements and the recombinations of the elements. Because while the uh, recombinations of the elements to form the zodiac signs is a very orderly system, the sigils that relate to the letters themselves seem to be more random and more original to uh, John Dee's work. Well, they, they got some form of assignation when uh, somebody created the language and, and, you know, what, why and how. You'd almost have to go back to the original moment of creation and see why it, it did it that way. What I would say uh, from... What I would understand from the work of Stan Tennant, 
who basically figured out that the Hebrew alphabet was basically constructed from a three-dimensional, uh, what was it called? I, I don't remember, but it's, it's a... Uh, the chauffeur, the ram's horn? No, 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 no. No, it's, it's just a sort of a, a twisting, uh, kind of looks like a ribbon that's twisted. Anyway, but the thing was, is this was this one single three-dimensional character or, or construction, if you looked at it from 26 different views, you got, the shadow showed each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And what's important, he said this was demonstrated that Hebrew was a sacred alphabet, but he also said it applied to Greek and Sanskrit and perhaps another alphabet, perhaps Islamic, I don't remember. But in any case, this is the way ancient alphabets were sometimes constructed. So you actually had a three-dimensional uh, figure or construction, and the, the two-dimensional letters were were rendered were were actually initially a rendering of a shadow of the three-dimensional thing in 360 degrees. So this uh, suggests that language is a, an attempt language of any type, at least as it was used or viewed by the ancient, was an attempt to reconstruct the whole. And we certainly see elements of this in, in the Enochian system, especially as you have laid out. You see that this is trying to uh, help us arrive at a, a dimensional understanding that is beyond three dimensions, and it is a comprehensive system. Though I think the most we could criticize the Enochian system is that, number one, we can say it's not perfect, but it is certainly an attempt, and because, you know, what system could be perfect? The second criticism is that it would be open to uh, misuse, which is the case with any system. So we can at least say that it is an effort to reconstruct uh which you might call a metaphor for the entire cosmos and the operating system of the cosmos. In this case, it would be uh, self-generating, self-reflective, and it would be, and, and more to the point, when we're talking about getting this into the common man, we can say that this is the extant algorithms of the universe getting us in touch with ourselves because that system is us every system is us and it's giving us an opportunity to be to flow into the into the whole to become part of and and this is the interesting thing what what I know from qigong is the first thing is when you have a a flow of life you want to perceive the flow you want to direct or intend the flow, and then as you become more capable, you want to control the flow, and then you want to create the flow, and ultimately you want to become the flow. So this is like, this is an opportunity for the universe sort of becoming itself, and to the degree that we're each constituent parts of the universe, we can uh, share in this experience knowledge and hopefully, uh, you know, towards the betterment of, of ourselves and everyone else. Over to you. Well, I definitely agree with all that. Um, I think that if uh, we were to look at the elements as being a limited system and then try to describe the cosmos based on their recombinations alone, we would find a very limited cosmos. And I think uh, it would be very predetermined in how it would act. And I don't think we find that universally across the uh, entirety of the cosmos uh, so much so as we do locally. Uh, the Milky Way um, seems to have a certain regularity. Uh, the sun orbiting around it has a certain uh regular uh, cycle that it follows. 
during our own lifetimes, well, during the history of mankind. And uh, the Earth going around the Sun, of course, has a very specific location, and the, the Moon going around the Earth as well. And even though all of that does seem to indicate to some extent predeterminism, uh, nevertheless, life on Earth appears to have free will. So if, you know, if we're looking at the, uh, the program encoding language, essentially that predetermines uh, all potential outcomes, uh, then the question becomes to what extent do we have authority over it or um, the ability to manipulate it or the uh, right to do so? Well, what, what I would answer there is that this system that we're talking about, whether it be the conglomeration or interaction of all the elements or the Enochian system itself or any other system, is that it is, it is an attempt uh, by either the God mind or uh, something emulating that to comprehend the entirety of, of everything. So this is the effort. So when you go in, and I have this in my video on the psychology of space-time, the 10th dimension, that's basically everything. It's, it's you know, it's all of creation. It's, it's the sum of creation. I was taught as a young uh, child that God was everywhere. God is everywhere. And of course, that was from a Christian reference point However, it makes a lot of sense because it's, it's the sum total of all creation. Now, as part of the sum total of all creation, uh, God or whatever name you want to attribute to it can't necessarily keep track of all of its parts in the sense that an accountant would. Um, that is a function of, it's actually a function of Scorpio and astrologically is accounting. So, and, and Scorpio is the sign of power. So, you know, you want to account for all of your creations and how do you do this, all of your assets. Basically, as you, as the, as the, what do you call it, the, the cosmos, or in, and when you take the solar system just as one microcosm of the whole, you, you devolve towards the sun, towards the ego. You start out with Pluto. Pluto is the, uh, the ruler of the divine energies, known as Kether. And it comes down through Uranus, which we already dis discussed, um, Neptune, which is the highest octave of spirituality, into Saturn, Jupiter, Mars. And then you get to the Earth, which is where you actually begin to live, whether it's as a reptile, as a bird, as a as larva. And then as you go into Venus, you reproduce, you reproduce, and then you have a mind. And that's Mercury. Mercury is the mind. And that's basically at the, I suppose you could call it the ass end of the solar system. And then Mercury, once you have a mind, then you go into the sun and you have an ego. And this is how the ego develops. It has to have a mind before it has an ego. And it has a, a point of self-reference. But this is an individuated, individualized viewpoint for every creation under the sun and under the cosmos. Every, there's this ego, and this ego is only there because it has a mind which evolved from all these other sort of uh, dissensions or come downs in, in the hierarchical scheme of the universe. So the game, if there is a God, would be to have unity with all of these minds. And you can say that God does have unity with all these things and all these factions, but the point becomes where, just like with a body, you have the neural net and it's all sort of becoming self-referential and it can all be itself. It can't be everywhere at the same time. It's only the consciousness that you have can flow. And when you have all of that flowing, you have some uh, metaphor for harmony throughout the universe. And then, then if you go into the Chinese element system, you have the elements constantly balancing and canceling each other out in a sort of cosmic dance. And this brings us back 
to the concept uh, of we were talking about all all the permutations of creation happening. That's basically what you have is a closed time-like curve where the end is the beginning. The end is the beginning and it just goes on forever and then there could be a multiplicity of these closed time-like curves with all the different permutations of existence. Therefore, the only thing we have, the only thing we have is consciousness and we have our own individualized consciousness which is uh, to some degree egocentric so therefore, it's only a question of becoming conscious of that which is outside of us. And that's kind of the game. It's like we're sort of in the game of God. We're playing that game on a microcosmic level, and he's playing it, or she's playing it, on a macrocosmic level. I don't know if I answered your question, but it triggered a lot of response. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I'm honestly learning, so uh, it's good. Um, most of what I've studied comes from books. Uh, I don't have very much experience uh, or experiential data in the field of practical uh, application of any of this material. So it's good to hear from somebody who does. Well, as I say, I don't. I don't practice this stuff um, like these, but certainly I've known people who have, uh, and you know they take it very seriously, and they will, they will get results. And when I tell you, uh, there are secret societies that are very highly uh, attuned or, or in control of certain political factions which do use this stuff, and how well they use it, exactly how they use it, I can't tell you. But it's, it's taken very seriously. But more, more to the point of, of where I come into this, I'm interested in this from the perspective of time travel because that's been my allotted uh, lot in uh, life to try to figure out and pursue. And so when, and all of the, and when I'm talking about words of power, intonations of power, as I've seen... Uh, Dr. Anderson come into my life in conjunction with some of these issues. Now, I know I've, I've said earlier that in my continuation of the Psychology of Space-Time video series, I will approach the subject of power. That's the next subject I will deal with when I have time to sit down and, and compose and create um, and dissect all of the issues. Now, certainly, he deals with the power of governments. I believe he deals with the power of secret societies and secret factions that control the governments. And I, I don't think he would have any choice because he has a technology which uh, is, is sort of, he has stated that uh, time is the only, you know, Kronos ate all of his children. Time is the only teacher which eats all of its pupils. This is symbolic of Kronos eating its children because Kronos did eat his children. Saturn ate his children. The only one who escaped was Zeus or Jupiter, who put the reins on Saturn, because Saturn was too restricting, too controlling. Uh, Jupiter was eased off and let everybody, you know, go to Disneyland and didn't keep track of where they went. So perhaps he was too generous. That's one of the faults um, and, and too, too jovial. But in any case, the uh, in in terms of the Enochian system or Doctor John D, this 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 is this issue which David Anderson has talked about, not in the context of of D or Enochian, but he talks about that with regards to time travel, that this stuff is so powerful and it is so prone to misuse, and that any observation into the timeline can change the timeline irreversibly. Now, he says there should be a moral compass, a committee with a moral compass that would put the reins on or somehow monitor a potential misbehavior. I find this very challenging to even think of as a concept because we're dealing now with human nature and we know from history that human nature is very tempted, uh, subject to temptation and corruption. So therefore, 
you could put a, a monitoring board, but are they going to be yes men? Or are they going to be this, that, or the other thing? So I think that the construction of a of a moral compass comes down to uh, the individuals who are basically in control of the system. And here we're talking about the time reactor. Uh, who is in charge of the time reactor? How much control does David actually have over it? He has a certain amount of control. I know at the beginning he kept his knowledge very separated. I was very impressed when I first met him, and, and this is when the time reactor was only the size of a soccer ball, how he said that, you know, when he had all of his research laboratories, the left arm didn't know what the right arm was doing. He kept that very secret. But there's a certain point where he's dealing with certain powers or authorities, whether they be governments, whether they be secret societies, or whether they be uh, the gods themselves, or natural circumstances that will put a rein on what he can and can't do. And this is perhaps one of the biggest challenges in dealing with him, because, you know, there's more that he can't say than there is that he can say. So when we, but we're going back into what I was talking about was putting this technology into the hands of the common man is not much different than putting the Anakian words of power and grimoire or grammar, magic spells, in other words, into the hand, and magic spells that work, I would say, into the hands of the commoner or the common people. So what, you know, if you have, let's just take John Q. Public, who is not necessarily, we're portraying somebody who's not too enlightened, and we're going to give him access to the time reactor. And the first thing you could expect is him to go seeking uh, out egotistical or selfish agendas that may or may not serve him in the end and certainly may or may not serve anybody else. So this means there has to be a restriction uh, or ideally there is a restriction from somebody um, indulging themselves to the potential detriment of others or, or the whole cosmos in that respect. So when you have putting this into the idea of the common man, if he's going to go into his own universe and do all this, it's not going to bother anybody. That's fine. But so it's almost like the life force naturally polices itself. Who can access this technology and who cannot access this technology? Uh, whether we're talking about time travel or the Enochian language and the words of power. When we have characters in secret society who have been running things, uh, for better or for worse, and certainly not running everything, they have gotten there through some peculiarity or particularity of their own existence, karma, circ set of circumstances. So it's, it's sort of like what this knowledge does when we talk about this, it brings us all a step further into the power realm of the power of choice. Because the more information we learn as an individual, the more that we can choose our destiny, the more opportunities, the more permutations we can visit, we can see. So if we can go back into a time machine and look at the way things really were as to the way we've been told they were, it gives us new perspectives. And I think that's the greatest beauty of uh, time travel is, is to actually open our consciousness to what could be, what was. It's, it's one step closer to the truth. It does, however, bring uh, the potential of chaos and the, the um, proverbial uh, metaphor of Pandora's box to mind, where, you know, all hell breaks loose. Go ahead. Well, I can't necessarily disagree with that. Uh, based on my own personal experiences, I haven't had any supernatural interference in merely studying the systems as I have uh, without doing anything practical I don't know if there's necessarily any risk uh, something we discussed in the last uh, lecture as well or rather in the last discussion was uh, the gatekeepers concept and I, I did want to follow up on that because 
the uh, ancient law of Hammurabi was one of the earliest codified legal systems to uh, state a punishment of uh, the ordeal of drowning for anyone who made an accusation uh, against someone uh, for the practice of witchcraft. And at the time, witchcraft was simply unsanctioned religious practice. So if you were doing the spells and uh, chants and, you know, foreseeing the omens, that the priests would be allowed to, but you weren't sanctioned by the religion of whatever temple was the deity that you were uh, essentially uh, clandestinely practicing the rites of. Uh, let me let me clarify uh, something. Can, let me clarify something on what you just said. What was the name of that um, ancient group you said? And spell it for people. If they want to look it up. Oh, uh, from the Code of Hammurabi. Yeah. How do how do you spell that? Uh, I believe H A M M U R A B I. Uh, it's uh, the name of an uh, ancient Mesopotamian king. Okay, and. To clarify, you said if somebody uh, put forth an accusation of witchcraft or spells. Now, I, I, I want to clarify that. Was it the person who did the accusing or was it the person who was accused would be drowned? Well, if there was proof given that the person who was accused was guilty, then they would be drowned. But if there was no proof given or insufficient evidence given in a trial, then the accuser would be drowned. Well, that's very harsh. So it's like uh, you either have to provide the proof or, uh, you know, be drowned yourself. This, this is a very, very brutal um, form of justice. So in other words, it's best to shut up. If you can't, if, if you don't, if you cannot exercise power over this spell giver. Well, uh, that's not necessarily the moral that I was trying to convey, well, no, but saying, that well, is true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but what were you trying to convey with reference to this, though? Go ahead. Uh, that's one of the earliest examples in at least written history of gatekeeping and the difference between doing ritual magic and doing sanctioned magic or religion. Uh, when, whenever people have throughout history since then been, you know, tried of being guilty or, you know, found, found guilty of practicing whatever form of ideology or science constitutes the idea of magic in that era, then they t they tend to get burned at the stake or you know mutilated in the uh, Inquisition or uh, crucified. Yeah, well, this is very relevant because it demonstrates that um, the people at the highest levels of power, whether it be government or clergy, take this deadly seriously, which tells tells us that anybody using this attempting to use it is considered a rival. Therefore, they must be eliminated. Uh, and wow, that, that, that's uh, and this goes into the next realm of the psychology of space time, which is censorship. So you're censoring people's ability to do this stuff. Now we live in a culture now where nobody is is going to censor you at least politically I mean in a uh, legal sense you can go cast all the spells you want and you're not going to get burned at the stake at least in America um, there there might be consequences uh, through other realms and whatnot you might be um, attracting other entities that, that might uh, consider you a rival to their powers but at least in the uh, plebeian sense of you know, the, the police aren't going to come to you and, you know, put you in jail for casting spells. It's, it's a very different era. So this is, um, when, but when I go take it back to the subject um, of time travel, you're dealing with the same thing. If, if you start experimenting with time, Dr. David Anderson has the proclivity to show up at your door because he has a temporal tremor detector and he can say, hey, you've been experimenting with time. What are you doing? And then all of a sudden, wow, okay, he knows this. 
So it, it's like this, we're dealing with a, you know, a constant, uh, the principle of gatekeeping in, in the universe. So this, this takes the realm of power, as, as he has often said, is often all, direct, all consumed with censorship. So now we're saying that power is, is a matter of gatekeeping and what gates can you walk through? Every one of us has a different gate in our lives. If you want to go to a university, you have to pass the gatekeeper, you know, with entrance exams and, and credentials. If you want to get a new job and get money, you have to go through the gatekeeper, the hirer. Um, if you want to go into Costco, you have to have a Costco card to get in. It's like everybody is moving in their own stream of life, their own orbit of life, and they have to deal with their own gatekeeping. It is a normal function of, of living in life. When we, we take it to the more extremes of, of power or the corridors of power, where we're talking about government, uh, the new book I'm working on, um, Inside the Earth, talks about getting past the gatekeepers to the inner earth. And more than gatekeepers, these are actual gates. Gates, um, I guess there's gatekeepers in between then, but it all has to do with resonance. It's what do you resonate? These gatekeep, these gate facilities into the inner earth will resonate with some people. The book that I'm publishing and editing is going to resonate with some people. It will answer many questions for those people who've consciously uh, or subconsciously explored these realms. It'll answer many questions. Some people won't could care less about it. They'll just go on living their workaday life. So it has a, all of this has to do with resonance. And like so many things that I've uh, studied or participated in, whether even the process of writing, it all comes back to yourself and your own journey and becoming self-aware. So it all comes back to the, the self eventually because the self is the one that started out on the quest in the first place. Well, that sounds, that sounds about right from uh, a series of different perspectives. Uh, if it comes back down to the uh, self uh, centered on the ego, <laughs> then... Um, each one of the each one of the pathways or signals on the uh, the uh, circuit board that forms its own little uh, piece of the program uh, is basically like an individual's lifespan, their travels uh, here and there, uh, and uh, you know not just across the surface of the earth, but also up and down uh, mentally. Uh, psychically and um, if uh, if we look at this entire system as artificial uh, I think it begins to become clearer how so many people seem to be caught up in the mundanity of social ritual behaviors uh, the interests of money and things such as material items and status in society. Uh, they're more or less automatons in that sense because they don't have uh, developed uh, egos in a vertical sense. They may have developed egos in a, in a downward sense even, but not uh, elevated. Um, in, in that regard... I think the uh, the system may be alive in a sense, but I don't think that life itself is boxed into the system exclusively. I think that life uh, has free will that can change the system. And I think that uh, the human practice of control is something that can be changed because I don't think it's necessarily a universal principle. Well, I, I, I would agree with you, but one thing is when we, we start talking about uh, 
gatekeeping and that everybody's on their own gate and, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's, there's another factor that, that involves, and this is what you would call outside interference, outside danger, because when we think of, you know, people just going along and doing their business, and we're also alluding to the prospect that some people are just too interested in uh, hand-to-mouth feeding themselves and gratifying their lower urges to live and survive and 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 this is like uh, and not seeking a uh, higher aspiration to evolve or move beyond where this becomes critical not only to those people but to anybody is we go back to the analogy of uh, Nazi Germany and I will just give an example from a, a friend of mine who was of German extraction his parents uh, were I think it was his grandparents or his parents, I don't remember, uh, lived in Nazi Germany. And they basically, they were not Jewish, but they said, things are going crazy here. And they moved to the United States. And that's how he got to the United States. So in other words, they saw the uh, chaos. In other words, whether you somebody likes the Nazi party or does not like it, it basically chaos was being bred there and great danger for anybody uh, particularly if you were Jewish or of a targeted ethnicity but it wasn't just dangerous for those people it was also dangerous for the Germans themselves because of what was going to ensue there and and not only in Germany but across Europe and, and many other parts of the world during World War II so when you have a menacing element on the horizon, and we can go back to the biblical stories of Sodom and Gomorrah, there was too much, like what you'd say, not paying attention to the higher aspirations of an individual. So an individual has to be a gatekeeper, not only for what's going on in his immediate world, uh, you know, does he have to make sure he has enough money to keep his kids fed and get them through school. But what is going on in the outside world around him that might discombobulate his, his life in a negative way? So I've constantly, uh, when we used to have meetings on Long Island, people would constantly bring up this stuff. Long Island's going to fall into the ocean. There's going to be a big tidal wave that's going to wipe out Long Island. And this kind of like real negative uh, prophecy that was being generated by people. And I always thought that it was the, the reason they did this is so that everybody would redu be reduced to their own level of misery. And this is a factor when, when you're but when you're dealing with gatekeeping, you have to you know keep the gates out on people like that. But you have to also keep keep the gates open to see if there is actual danger and are you are you in the right place at the right time this is just a, a point of reference that's very important so when we're talking you know my interest with regards to the technology of time travel that has its own sometimes there are elements associated with that which can be very dangerous or dubious and don't walk down that pathway let it resolve itself That's all I had to say about that. Well, um, if I, I don't have much more than that to add. Uh, if, if we're going to talk about uh, time travel as it relates to the Enochian material, uh, I'd be happy to do so, but it's a huge subject. Well, I think we should save that for our next podcast if, if we decide to go down that road. Um, I agree. We've... we've uh, you know, we've gone wherever we've gone today, and it's it was a day, basically a follow up to our last podcast, which produced some very nice results. So we'll see where we go with this one. So uh, I thank you very much for uh, participating at the spur of the moment here. And uh, you know, my website uh, is timetraveleducationcenter.com, and also to get books, skybooksusa.com, and give your website again, Jonathan. 
Uh, well, today my websites are YouTube, Benfadia, B-E-N-P-A-D-I-A-H, and Issue Benpadia, I-S-S-U-U, B-E-N-P-A-D-I-A-H. And uh, those are my video and ebook websites. Great. Thank you very much.